I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Kevin Miller. Welcome to Western Window, the show made for you by students at Western Washington University. This time on Western Window, we're reaching back into the archives and selecting a few of our favorite stories that profile just some of the ways that Western students are using their active minds to change lives. In this episode, we'll chat with Dr. Ryan Dudenbostel, the Director of Orchestral Studies. We'll travel along with some students who are learning about decontamination, and we'll find out more about BRAVE, a program that's helping people struggling with depression on campus. We'll find out what happens when local middle schoolers take their studies outside, and we'll find out what local elementary school students are creating in one Western academic enrichment program. So stay with us as we explore our world through Western Window. Extending their lessons beyond their classrooms, local middle school students head outdoors for hands-on lessons in ecology, watershed science, and civic engagement, all taught by students at Western's Huxley College of the Environment. The outdoor school is um, done with sixth graders from Whatcom Middle School at the Gordon Carter Environmental Learning Center on Lake Whatcom. They learn about um, phosphorus and eutrophication in Lake Whatcom, stream macroinvertebrates, and they learn about winter wren habitat and old growth forests. And then at the end of the two days, we have a stewardship lesson where the students get to become stakeholders in the Lake Whatcom watershed and discuss solutions um, to problems with Lake Whatcom water quality. What this program gives that complements what the kids get in their classroom is quite important. Their classroom science curriculum in sixth grade includes a full unit on ecology and populations that includes uh, six different components. Uh, it, it takes several months to teach all of that. So part of the purpose is to um, give them some lessons that engage them in, hand, in a hands-on way in doing ecology. And I think um, most children, most young people are in, uh, instinctively environmentalists. I think people are born with biophilia for love of other species. And we kind of drum it out of people by some of the ways we raise kids and the way our culture works and like to reawaken that biophilia. My favorite part about Gordon Carter is getting to see the kids enjoy being outside and learning new things and making connections um, with what they learn in the lessons. I think education isn't necessarily just about the names of things, the facts of things. I think a lot of things um, depend on little small connections that are hard to create when you're sitting in a classroom. What we're doing out here is really place-based and it's a unique opportunity for a lot of these kids to to come outside and and to apply maybe you know scientific or uh, natural history um, to the place that they're in right now. I personally believe that all students benefit from classroom outside especially with science. If they're studying you know botany or um, natural history those are all outdoor based activities and it feels really contrived to put it inside of a, a box. That we're start, trying to convey um, it's everyone's job together to decide how we manage these common resources that we depend on for clean water. I think the program as a whole is working on creating um, ecologically literate citizens who will make wise decisions about resources and about their, the places that they live. So ecological literacy denotes a high level of understanding of how our earth systems function because those are our life support systems. One metaphor is the earth spaceship. Um, we're on a spaceship, we need to know how it works. Um, ecology provides the operating instructions um, and we're all the crew so we need to know those instructions and, and what they imply for what we, what the consequences are of different choices we might make. In 
the next award-winning segment, Kevin Hines talks openly about his struggles with mental health. His goals are to create a space where community members can discuss the realities of suicide and to inspire people to find hope and to seek help for their own mental struggles. Here at Western, Building Resilience and Voicing Empathy, or BRAVE, is a campus-wide program that provides resources for people struggling with depression. It provides support for their friends and family, and it aims to break down stigmas, offering a path towards resilience. It's been almost 80 years since the construction of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. From 1937 to now, it has been estimated that 1,700 people have jumped from the bridge, making it the second most used suicide location in the world. The 70 meter drop kills 98% of jumpers. About 26 people have survived the drop. September of the year 2000, Kevin Hines attempted to end his life at the age of 19. In the four seconds between letting go of the rail and hitting the water, he gained a new perspective on life. Living with severe mental illness or, or brain disease uh, is the hardest thing I do on a daily basis. Prior to my attempt on the Golden Gate Bridge, me going over that rail, I was hearing voices in my head telling me I had to die, telling me I was a burden to everyone around me, telling me that I was useless, worthless and less than, that I had no purpose. None of that was true. My brain was trying to kill me. I was trying to stay alive. And that's, if you can imagine a, a pain deriving from here that doesn't just cause headaches and, and migraines, but causes you to see things that don't exist to anyone but you, hear things that don't exist to anyone but you, believe that that you have no other option but to die. I wasn't trying to hurt my family. I wasn't trying to hurt my friends. I was trying to make the pain in my brain stop. Recognizing today that that pain that has caused my brain is because of chemistry allows me to, every time I get that pain, choose life and ask the people next to me for help. And that's what this is about. It's about reaching out to this audience <clears throat> and the people that show up today. It doesn't matter if there are five people in that audience or, or 500. The people that are in the audience were the ones that needed to be there. And I hope to reach them. And I can tell you that I will never attempt to take my own life again. Is the exact same thing that 19 Golden Gate Bridge jump survivors have also said that I had people that cared about me and loved me, and I learned that I had to take responsibility for my mental illness, and I had to fight it tooth and nail. Today, Kevin is using his second chance to make a difference, sharing his story to inspire hope and promoting resources that can mean the world for those in need. I would say that if you're living with a brain disease, a brain health condition of any kind, and you don't know what to do. There are local chapters of the National Alliance on Mental Illness that can help you and your family. There are suicide prevention organizations like Suicide Awareness Voices of Education, save.org, that can guide you to how to help and he yourself and heal. There are, th there's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-8255. Press one for active duty military veterans or servicemen and women. Um, all of these things can be tools to guide you to a better place. Here at Western, Farrah Green Palmer manages the university's suicide prevention program called BRAVE. We call it BRAVE, which stands for Building Resilience and Voicing Empathy. And right now we're having our very first depression and seasonal affective disorder screening day called Beat the Blues. I think every school should have a suicide prevention program. And before I got here, I think Western was doing some things with prevention and wellness services, but kind of just, you know, here or there. And then uh, 
they had, you know, anytime anybody has more than one or two deaths by suicide, they start to pay attention. And so several years ago, there were a few, um, not sure about exact numbers, I wasn't here then, but that's why they wrote the grant. They felt like we need to make sure that we're showing everyone we take suicide prevention seriously, we take mental health seriously. Uh, you know, we care about our students. Both of us are peer counselors for the CPIT program, which okay. is a crisis prevention intervention <laughs> team. <laughs> and, well, what we do is we, we will reach out to people who have called or gotten in touch with us. Um, they're in crisis, and it doesn't matter. We go to them, and we we're peer counselors. We each of us go out with clinicians, and we, we sit down and have conversations and. and provide all the resources that they may need. I guess what I want people to know is that they can recover and that, you know, it's not weakness actually. It takes a lot of courage to speak up and be vulnerable in front of people. And, and that doesn't mean you need to tell everyone. Just find a few people that you trust and people who uh, know what they're talking about and can help you. In 1989, the citizens of Washington passed the Model Toxic Control Act with the highest approval rating of any state initiative to date. This act provides the funding for the cleanup of toxic contamination statewide, and Western Washington University students are getting a special opportunity to learn about the science of cleanup and decontamination. We're talking about our bay and our city. We're talking about our air and we're talking about our water. This is stuff that we all need and we all care about. Understanding that just your community, your environment is something that you can learn about and then gain the skills to then help your communities make decisions about how their community ought to be. SMOX is the Science and Management of Contaminated Sites, and it's a series of classes that we teach at Western Washington University and Huxley College of the Environment. The courses take students through the process of understanding how to and determining what to do with a contaminated site. If you think about it, historically, we've had lots of different industries and lots of different activities that would occur that would result in chemicals being released into the environment. Chemicals that have been identified as being harmful to human health or the environment, and they're present in the environment at concentrations that are in exceedance of what they should be. At the large scale, the science and management of contaminated sites classes are important for a number of reasons. I think that the courses are kind of unique in that we have an external agency like the Washington State Department of Ecology who's supporting it. So what that does is that provides this external indication that this work is relevant beyond just the classroom. One of our favorite activities is to take the students to Hanford, which is near Richland in the Tri-Cities of Washington. And when we go there, we're actually able to get a special tour from the Department of Energy. So we get on a bus and we drive through the Hanford Reservation and we are able to see how they clean up contaminated sites. We're able to see their waste and we're able to see things like the reactors where they made the plutonium. There's nothing like Hanford for people to get this palpable feeling, you know, goosebumps of this is what this looks like. We're, these were the decisions we made as a country and now we've got this legacy. What is the right thing to do? And there's no real clear, easy answer to that question. It's this fascinating historical story of World War II, of bomb making, of um, the Cold War, and of a community left with a legacy that they didn't fully understand. Bringing the students there gives them a sense of how important cleanup is for a community, for a state, and for a nation. Um, it was very inspiring to kind of see a contaminated site. There's a lot of contamination that's on the property. They are now in remediation and actually treating a lot of the hazardous waste on site. And so we got to do a bus tour and kind of go around and see 
how the process actually works in real life. And we got to talk to a lot of people who are also involved in the process and their kind of opinions on it. It was a good experience, a lot of fun. And a lot of it is just having a passion for treating contamination. And you know, if you recognize contamination as a problem and you want to learn a bit about how you can be a part of the solution to that problem, SMOX is a great way to get into that. Hoping to get involved with uh, stormwater research and management. It's a massive problem. Everywhere you go, there's paved services with contamination running off of the roads, running off of the parking lots, getting into our water sources. For students who are just coming in and trying to figure out what they want to do, I think that there are a lot of environmental problems that people see as sort of relegated over, oh, let the environmentalists deal with that. And we need more than just the environmentalists dealing with environmental problems. These are problems that we all live with. Quite simply, the work that can be done around cleaning up contaminated sites is important. We know that chemicals in the environment can be harmful, and I think a lot of us recognize that we don't want that harm to come, and so we have to do something about it. And so this is the world where that happens. Dr. Ryan Dudenbostel is the Director of Orchestral Studies right here at Western. He conducts the Western Washington University Symphony Orchestra and teaches courses in conducting and music theory. He's performed around the world, worked in New York and LA, is an accomplished clarinetist, and was one of fewer than a dozen Americans invited to participate in the international conducting competition in Barcelona. And he's bringing his passion for music back to the place where he got his start. Dudenbostel is a Western Washington University alum. What's it like to conduct an orchestra? I'm almost afraid to tell you because if I, if I tell you how much fun it is, then everybody will want to become a conductor. Conducting is a gestural language that communicates uh, specific information to a group of musicians. So I'm showing how fast we're going, I'm showing um, how loud, how soft, um, this needs to be a little louder, this should be a little softer, so balancing things, and also um, what we call articulation, uh, how short, how long, um, whether something should be pressed a little harder, or whether something should be kind of softened out. So the conductor's job really is to come up with one interpretation and get everybody on board so that they're all making the same piece in the same way. It's really magical. Um, and especially in performance um, with a good orchestra who's flexible, when, if you want to try something new and they go with you and you never talked about it, it's just a, you, you moved a little bit in this way and they moved in that way. Um, it's really quite special that the depth of that connection when no words are, exch are exchanged. I started at 15, yeah. I really had no idea what I was doing. But you know, when you're, when you're that age, things don't seem hard, even though they really are. And so I'm grateful, actually, to have kind of cut my teeth when I didn't have the fear of failure as much. Got involved conducting here. Uh, I had a very supportive teacher, David Wallace, who's now retired, gave me a lot of uh, really unusual opportunities for an undergraduate. And then I went from there to graduate school at the Kansas City Conservatory and then to my doctorate at UCLA. I conduct the University Symphony Orchestra, which is a full symphony, um, 80 members uh, from across the campus community, about half of whom are music majors and the other half represent all the different uh, colleges and departments of Western. I find music absolutely fascinating um, for a few reasons. Um, number one, what we get as classical musicians from composers is a very sophisticated system of notation uh, that still leaves a lot up to the interpreter to figure out. So um, uh, a piece of music is essentially a recipe. And there's a lot in the recipe that's assumed. And I love that meeting of the, the concrete sophisticated notation and what the interpreter, the artist, has to uh, backfill. 
I think what we've done here at Western uh, in this year is, is something that I, I really will cherish. Um, the students are wonderful and hardworking and curious uh, and game really to do anything, um, which is very exciting as a conductor. That's a great question. Are all eyes on me if the orchestra's playing? Well, it's sort of like um, they, they watch, they have to be reading the music. Um, and they occasionally, if they're playing a long note, they can look up from the note and then look back, back down at it. But most of the communication is through peripheral vision. So they can see the motion, even though they're not looking at me directly, um, they can still keep track of where I'm at with the motion. There are always little adjustments all the time. And you, you train an orchestra to be sensitive to that by uh, doing it in rehearsal. I think orchestral music is fantastic and exciting and fascinating and interesting and completely accessible um, to people who know a lot about music or don't know anything about music. When you have 80 people on stage, uh, you know, going for it 100% playing like as loudly as possible or as softly as possible, there's something really gripping about that. It's like, because we the conductors, we don't actually make sound, which is the odd thing, being a musician. We just, we move through the air and we communicate how we want sounds to be. But it almost is like the sound becomes tangible if the orchestra is really responsive. And you can, you can draw a line through the air and it's almost like you're, you're moving something or you're moving through fluid or you can see the trace behind it in the sound. And that's a really magical, surreal thing. What can students in grades five through seven accomplish in their after school hours? Would you believe build robotic underwater submersibles from the ground up? In the next award-winning segment, we find out what young minds can accomplish when given a challenge, a few materials, and the right kind of encouragement. They started out with oh no. some oh no. pieces of PVC and some bilge pump motors and some propellers and they have compiled it into functional underwater robots that they are deploying for the first time in the actual bay today. So that, are you excited about that? I'm very excited about that. Pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited because they're actually working. Right. So that's a big deal. Right. We've got sound. They built hydrophones from scratch. So they started out with piezoelectric elements and wired them to microphone cords and have plugged those into speakers. And they're hearing sound underwater. So pretty cool. The whole focus has been on sensors, and so we've talked about different um, parts, uh, different parameters in the ocean. They want to be able to measure. Why would oceanographers be interested in different things in the ocean? And then and then what, um, yeah, what they can measure. So they're interested in the temperature, they're interested in the, the pressure, they're interested in the salinity, the pH. Um, some kids are really interested and they want to know about the acidification that's going on, which is a big focus at, our, at the lab, so that was pretty neat. We are listening to what's happening underwater. There's a hydrophone attached to the back that, um, that um, captures the noise and puts it into the speakers so we can listen. We're trying to get the information out that oceans are important and uh, all, uh, our environment and the way that we take care of ourselves on a, on a grand scale, on a planetary scale, uh, is important and we all have a role to play in that. And we, we start that with not just the undergraduate education, but we also do it through extended ed. Extended ed programs are teaching young children uh, a variety of uh, things like this ROV camp that's going on. They've had other programs that are more uh, organism focused. And in all of those cases, um, the real intent there is to get hands-on learning. 
for the kids so that they pay attention to the environment and so that we can take care of our planet. They're aware of a lot of the marine issues that are going on and they're wanting to test that out and they get to actually do that with the real ROVs that they put together themselves. So pretty, pretty cool. We want to help the environment. It's like there's, it feels like there's more and more pollution every day. So we want to like find out how, just how bad the problem is. We're, we have a camera on it and we're measuring to see the, if there's the more fish, fish in the water ratio. or if there's more trash in the water. And so if there is more trash in the water, we want to be able to, you know, help the environment. To see these guys interested in... Yeah, cool, you can take it out. ...science applied. Well, I think I saw a fish. Real world. So if... Yep, it works. <laughs> this is exciting to me. This is exciting. That is, that is why I'm doing this. I get to see these kids who are bubbles. have this understanding at a really young age of, of applied science and that they well, have this knowledge that they have some power to go into the world and study the sea and, and actually make a difference. I'm gonna drive the boat. We're not gonna be driving the boat. He's up the word. Seeing the kids light up, seeing a kid's face when they first see a starfish. And they start, they start to make that connection with the environment. That's why I'm here. That's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time as we explore our world at and around Western Washington University. Western Window is proud to partner with the following student publications. Clipson Magazine is published twice each quarter and includes features, multimedia, and issues that affect lives across the greater Bellingham area. You can find it online at clipsonmagazine.com. The Western Front is the official newspaper of Western Washington University, published by the Student Publications Council and funded by your advertising dollars. The Western Front. Get it first, get it right, at westernfrontonline.net. The Planet is Western Washington University's award-winning quarterly environmental publication and the only undergraduate environmental magazine in the United States. Explore the Planet online at planet.www.edu.